Hello and welcome to The Bipile, the only online comic book review column of the writer who is featured on Afrolit Sans Frontiers. I'm your host, online gadfly Hannibal Taboo, and you can find me on social media here, as well as look up my career or buy books at my website here. Let's get started. Dun, 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 the Bipile. There are four sections to the reviews. The titular by pile is for books in a series that's been by worthy more than three issues in a row or from comics so good they demanded purchase in the moment let's get started with die number 11 from image comics a creative team of kieran gillen stephanie hans and clayton cowles if you've been reading this meta fantasy theme series for some time this issue will be very rewarding as it gives quality attention to characters and themes that have been percolating for months if you have no idea what's going on and have never read this work you're going to be completely lost and have no idea what in the name of Gary Gygax is going on here. From the front page of the book, in 1991, six teenagers disappeared into a fancy role-playing game. Only five returned. In 2018, they're all dragged back in. They can't go home until six agree. They don't. The party wars. This includes a brand new tabletop role-playing game invented in part by Gillen and world-building this deeply developed and entrancing, running vague but not Derivative similarities to Curse of Strahd and other possibly familiar settings to the 5e crowd. There are vague parallels to classes you might recognize. The Grief Knight is a kind of paladin. Godbinders are like lazy Susan Warlocks. Neos are like artificer sorcerers of code. The Fool is a brash rogue with the luck feet pumped into overdrive. The odd classes are dictators. Imagine a class built around the spell's charm, dominate person, command in their ilk, and masters who serve as architects of the relative rules for localized reality, who, by practice, have a bad experience if they try to play directly, a la DMs. Two members of the group hold court in the vampire kingdom of Angria, where they seek to enforce their idea of positive change on this world that they fear they've abandoned. Three more are fugitives and desperate to return to the real world. One is, well, that's a long story, and he's mostly out of the game. As stated, if you've been reading this book, you know the struggle of the Grief Knight, the sacrifices the Godbinder has made, and the shocking work of the Dictator, as well as the numbness she's experiencing. Karen Gillen's script here gives her and the Grandmaster a surprising moment of intimacy and friendship, while dual-wielding the visuals from Stephanie Hans and Clayton Cowles in a crafty and effective action scene. The work is literary and engaging in its developments here, and its visuals are sweeping and gothic. True. It's not much made to bring in new players, but the game is afoot, and play is definitely at a very high level, so that rating is by. Next up, Suicide Squad number 6 from DC Comics with the creative team of Tom Taylor, Bruno Redondo, Adriano Lucas, and Wes Abbott. Once upon a time, the United States government decided to offer some of its worst convicts a chance at redemption through clandestine black bag missions as Task Force X, colloquially called the Suicide Squad. This went predictably destructively for years and years, leading to a superpowered cadre called the Revolutionaries infiltrating the squad to shut it all down. Now the newly combined squad is on the run in Gotham City, having murdered their handler and intent to take down the power behind the strings. Even if you didn't see the cover, that would make clear that some of what's going on in this issue. But again, Tom Taylor turns in a king of a script that gives brushes of characterization for most of the ten main players here. Deadly Six is good with computers. Chaos Kitten has a soft spot for dogs, while delivering some truly memorable action scenes. Why is this collection of miscreants in Gotham City? Harley knows somebody who could remove the bombs that Task Force X installed in each of their bodies, and it's not someone around her Coney Island apartment buildings. This series has enthusiastically avoided all of that continuity. Unfortunately, the problematic power behind the curtain has put a plan in motion that'll make Gotham even messier than normal. That inevitably brings the bat to play as he shows off his detective skills as well as his gift for pugilism. As Harley Quinn says, It's not the first time I've stood on a dark Gotham street surrounded by mysteriously unconscious people. I'm not going to lie, it's never ended well. With a wonderful nostalgic, nostalgic twist from Wes Abbott, Bruno Redondo, and Adriano Lucas turns in a fight scene that's really, really good. It leads to an epic time-stalling one-on-one between Batman and Deadshot. Just when it gets good, the interaction between the two characters gets even better with a dog, a computer, and the offer of a phone call. Tom Taylor makes the dialogue super engaging, and the whole package is superbly entertaining. So that rating is by. Next one's a pleasant surprise. Captain America Marvel Snapshot, number one from Marvel Comics, with the creative team of Mark Russell, Ramon Perez, Rico Renzi, and Joe Sabino. 
This very clever and surprising issue takes an altered look at the aftermath of 1976's Captain America number 193, putting a true human face on the cost of the mad bomb detonation that turned New Yorkers on each other. The events are seen through the eyes of Felix Waterhouse, a naturally gifted engineer from the South Bronx who just wants to go to college and develop his gift for technology. Unfortunately, the detonation of the mad bomb changes the course of his life, leading him to deliver truth to power in ways he never could have expected. What's best about this Mark Russell script is its subtlety, the patience in which it lays out its play and gives characters something they rarely get a chance for in a major label licensed book, development. Captain America learns something here, and if there was ever a hero who was poised to get a lesson in 1976, it's well time the Cap would receive it. The art from Ramon Perez, Rico Renzi, and Joe Sabino could easily be showing parts of the Bronx today as well as in the 1970s, where casual disregard from the city's powers that be, costumed or otherwise, have often left a disenfranchised population to their own devices. And we all know what they say about idle hands. The visuals present crystal clear storytelling. The splash page with the madness gripping the citizens is particularly gorgeous. Kudos for the period appropriate ads. But the lab scenes are also Kirby-tastic too. All this maintains the whiff of nostalgia that could make this appear like a lost classic. It is problematic, all the suffering that a black man has to go through eventually, so some super empowered white people can figure out something? Of course. But that unfortunate trope, from the Green Mile to Captain America Civil War, has led to other valuable moments, so it's a pyrrhic victory to see Cap finally working to save the people who are suffering instead of avenging them. This issue is a pleasant surprise. Had it really affected things in the past and would have led to less would have led to a less horrible present i don't know but the rating here is bye honorable mention the second section of the reviews is called honorable mention for books that were good but maybe not good enough to get your actual money out of your actual pocket there we find batman number 93 from dc comics with a creative team of james tenyon the fourth guillaume march javier fernandez tomio more David Barron, and Clayton Cowles. Sorry for any mispronunciations. For some time, the Dark Knight detective has been chasing the ghost of criminals past. Close to the time of his debut, a master criminal called the Designer, Panda, Panda, came to Gotham City with proposed upgrades for Penguin, Riddler, Catwoman, and Joker that would have essentially been a lawless version of Pimp My Ride for their extra-legal careers. Unable to fathom the madness of the Joker, the whole plan fell to pieces and the designer apparently disappeared, only to return years later to face a much more skilled bat. Honestly, prior to this issue, the whole storyline felt rather dragged out, like a comedian staying on stage long after the venue has flashed the light for them to see the spotlight. This time, however, ah this time we finally see a spark of something different. And when it hits, it's one of those insert, insert chef kiss gifts moments as a disruptive pleasure. Writer James Tenney the Fourth script delivers that moment with such deftness and it's a genuine surprise that elicits from its victims it's very impactful. Sadly, the, there are less effective elements. The Joker's new gun mall punchline is a cliche, yet somehow does not seem overly concerned fighting the much more experienced Harley Quinn, who has quite a resume and should have handled this much more efficiently. Every scene in that segment is off-putting, like a badger holding its own against a bear. There's one moment when the Batman has a mask in his hand that doesn't exactly make itself clear, which sort of makes sense if you look at the background of a subsequent panel, but it's somewhat implausible given Batman's renowned martial abilities. If examined too closely, elements of the narrative begin to unravel like Weezer's sweater. There's no denying the cleverness of the reveal, but it was a little clunkier than it needed to be getting there, so that rating is honorable mention. Meh. Nah. The third section of the reviews is called the meh pile for books that well, they weren't bad, but didn't go all the way to good either, often having their positives and minuses wash each other out in the middle. Here we have Thor number five from Marvel Comics with a creative team of Donnie Cates, Nick Klein, Matt Wilson, and Joe Sabino. Thor and Galactus stand together against the sentient force that ended the universe before the one we know, empowered and bloodied but ready for a fight with a heck of a twist in me. Here's the thing. This book is gorgeous. Thor is awash in the power of, as the All-Father and the added might of the power cosmic bestowed by Galactus. It may not have made as much of a visual impact as since John Romita Jr. showed the Thunder God stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thanos and Mangog. Nick Klein, Matt Wilson, and Joe Sabino present a simply magnificent show of power and divine glory, and that's well worth seeing. 
Sadly, the story behind it is much less impressive. While Thor technically fights against the end of everything, there's a lot of voiceover telling you what's happening more than the visual show. And that's literally the opposite of what any high school writing teacher would mark you down for. The actual mechanics of the battle are largely abstract, and that's less engaging than this conflict should be. Likewise, its montage section was too inside baseball to connect, trying to shortcut the idea of a threat without developing it natively. Admittedly, there is one twist in the last act of this issue that's a true surprise, a layered revelation that could make one stop and think about literally hundreds of previous stories in a different way. It's one of those moments that overcomes a lot of deficits, but this issue is still far more sizzle than steak. Swing and a miss, alas, but here we are. That rating is meh. No, just no. The final section of the reviews is called No, Just No, and it's reserved for comics that are absolutely terrible and should not be purchased under any circumstances. The good news is, no books received this rather odious honor this week. With three big purchases, I'd call this week a win, but I'm happy to see what you have to say in the comments. Please like and subscribe for more of these reviews. You can also find them on the iHeartRadio podcast, Nerdorama with Mo and Tawala, and weekly on BleedingCool.com. I'm elated to be here with you and appreciate your time. Since 2003, this has been the Bipile, and I'm Hannibal Taboo. See you next time.